Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Can you hear me okay? Yes. I have a, a bit of an apology. Uh, I have uh, been on the Asian time zone this week. Uh, I have been in the last three days in five cities. Uh, and my body can't figure out whether it's coming or going. Uh, in fact, I think I just passed myself in the airport. <laughs> So my voice is a little raspy, and my energy is a tad bit worn. But you know that's what love is. Love is work. Non-love is laziness, and anti-love is evil. Now, evil exists, but it's very rare. Most people are just lazy. Emotionally lazy, intellectually lazy, psychologically lazy, financially lazy, organizationally lazy. They just don't want to do the work. Mr. Smith does the work. And he does it in a way that is accentuated by a quality that I respect most. It's called passion. The Bible suggests be hot or be cold. But if you're lukewarm, I'll snatch you up. Translation, even God is not like mediocre. I try to live my life 8 to 10. 1 to 5 is mediocrity. 5 to 7 is entertainment. Ladies, that's the guy you date, but you don't marry. <laughs> And there's a time and a place for everything. By the way, young people in here, message for you. Finish school, get good grades, apply yourself, go to college. It should be not K through 12, it's K through college. Finish college, come out, get a job, get a career, have a child. After you get married, in that order. I know that doesn't sound mind blowing. But in some ways, we lost our storyline. And when I said that five to seven is entertainment, we sort of, many of us get stuck right there. But eight to 10 is excellence. And you cannot substitute passion. Elaine Fisher, who works for me here at Operation Open Denver, has a great deal of passion. Your superintendent has a great deal of passion. I just met him and talked to him for a little bit. And uh, I thought he was so cool, I made him an honorary black man. And <laughs> hey, you look at him in the seat right now, you see it working. <laughs> Mr. Smith has this passion, but where does his passion come from? It's like giving him credit for being a tree without recognizing that the, oftentimes the tree roots are deeper and longer and richer than the physical stock you see. But we only acknowledge what we see. Where's Mr. Smith's mug? Please stand up. for Denver, as I understand. So I will not be doing anything inappropriate around you. Where is Mr. Smith? It doesn't stop there. Where is his father? But he's not 
be a bad accident. He didn't drive himself up here. He's a product of a mother sitting to his right and a father. Where's your father? Sitting so he can see. So he can get a sense of who he can be. It's an old parable. Watch how you live your life. It may be the only Bible that anybody else reads. And so, why is this relevant to Dr. King's birthday? Because we think about Dr. King, and now that he's been enshrined in this monument, rightly so, in Washington, D.C., we bring him iconic status. We make him otherworldly. But we only limit him, most of us, to I have a dream. That's all anybody seems to know about Dr. King is I have a dream. And other than that, we just made him perfect. And if you make him perfect, he's not reaching. But thank God, I, my mentor is Ambassador Andrew Young. You don't know that name, you need to go research. Ambassador Andrew Young was a strategist in the Civil Rights Movement. He was Dr. King's most senior aide in the Civil Rights Movement. I'll get to him in a moment. But through Andrew Young, and through, by the way, I call him Ambassador Andrew Young. I shouldn't be calling him man. My generation shouldn't be calling him man. I'm sure nobody in South Africa said, hey, you know, what's up, Nelson? What's up, Nell? That's Nelson Mandela. That's a living icon. But we get casual. We get casual about greatness around us. And we forget to acknowledge them or appreciate them when they're alive. And we wait until they die to give them the honors that they so rightly deserve. Dr. King died chain smoking, <laughs> overweight, and depressed. You didn't hear that part of the story, did you? He thought he had failed. But look at him now. You want to make God laugh, tell him your plan. But to understand Dr. King and that greatness is to understand Daddy King. Who's Daddy King? Let me reframe this. Dr. King was a PhD in theology in 1958 in Alabama. Okay, the coffee is to the side. I need to wake up. Let me come at this one more time. I don't want to let that even run over your head. You responded like, of course he was. King was a PhD, a black man, if you didn't know it, in Alabama in 1958. You gotta be crazy. You gotta be out of your cotton picking mind to think you're gonna be a PhD in anything other than running in 1958 in Alabama. He didn't just wake up one day and everything lined up for him? First of all, if you were a PhD in 1958 and you were black in Alabama, you are not middle class, you are upper middle class. Let me make this clear. Dr. King's father, is, they called him Daddy King, Martin Luther King Sr. Dr. King's mother, Alberta King, formerly Alberta Williams. Dr. King's dad served on the board of a bank for 40 years. Now think about Occupy Wall Street now, and they, they got, they got a good, good, good reason to be upset. They got a lot of legitimacy. But you cannot become an expert only in what you are against. You've got to figure out what you're for. And then go do something about it. So the first note is Dr. King was an optimist. But that didn't come from just his DNA. So when Dr. King and Daddy King co-founded Ebenezer Church in Atlanta, Dr. King's daddy preached home ownership, small business ownership, owning rights, and of course education. I find it interesting that Daddy King first went to Bryant School. And later on, when he tried to go to Morehouse, and by the way, Dr. King's father was functionally illiterate by our standards. 
had never finished grade school. When he went to try to go back to school, he put him back in the fourth grade as an 18 year old. But he said, I'm going to school. No one's going to keep me from my glory. Ignorance has no future. And so he went to school. And then, by the way, when he did Brian school, he went to Morehouse to try to get in. Everybody told him, you're not, you're not college material. You, you just go do something else. But a man named, and I, you can't make this up, the man who was president of Morehouse was John Hope. <laughs> do your own research. I love this stuff. You can't make this stuff up. John Hope Bryant was in the story of Daddy King's life. Now I'm paying particular attention. Young Daddy King, King Sr. went to Morehouse, got crappy grades, had to work from KC in the morning to KC at night, didn't do much better, was repeatedly warned about being kicked out, but he graduated finally with honors. Message, rainbows only follow storms. You cannot have a rainbow without a storm first. I was talking to the superintendent about these schools and what supposedly tough jobs Mr. Smith has. And I think Mr. Smith has a blessing to feel a job. First of all, it's hard to fall on the floor. <laughs> If you can't find your way up on the floor, something's wrong. How are you doing, Mrs. Smith? Oh, I'm doing good. I'm at 2%. Well, if I was at zero, 2% is really good. I'm playing, but I'm serious. He's got an incredible opportunity. In order for the superintendent to be the model school district in America, he needs Mr. Smith to succeed. But I'll come back to that in a minute. Daddy King was torn between going into ministry, and he was a minister from a very young age, to going in business. It was a conflict for him, so he decided to vote. And he accumulated real estate, and he accumulated business acumen and investment. Fast forward, he co-founded Citizens Trust Bank, which today in Atlanta is the Nancy the building of the Martin Luther King Senior Complex next to Ebenezer Church where Operation Hope is building a Hope Financial Dignity Center as a anchor tenant. You can't make this stuff up. <laughs> Dr. King knew and Daddy King knew that black folks and those in civil rights causes were always caught up over money. In fact, it's not just black folks. Al Capone killed people in broad daylight. He'd come up to you and just blow you away. Everybody, I didn't see a thing. They could never convict him of a thing, but they got on tax evasion. I guess the government said that's illegal and immoral, you shouldn't do it, but if you're going to do it, we want our cut. Anyway, I'm giving you guys my best stuff. It's going right over your head. You're like, wow. Conversation. Is that okay? Yeah. Daddy King decided to neutralize the issue of financial influence on his own. Dr. King worked for free. I don't know if you knew that. He worked for free. Let me tell you something really magical. And I'm sure this is like, I'm a resource, I'm, I'm overpowered, I, got, I don't have enough people, I don't have enough money, I don't have enough budget. SCLC, Dr. King's organization, had an annual budget of $600,000 and 60 full-time employees. Wait a minute, he changed the world? And he did it without firing a shot? And he went up against the most powerful nation on the planet? And he did it with 60 people? And an annual budget that is equal to my monthly payroll. And yet you have organizations here in Denver who say, oh, I'm going to give out $2 million. Oh, they're slicing my budget from $5 million. I'm not quite sure what I'm going to do. <laughs> we got high class problems, folks. We got high class.
high class problems. Back to the story. When Dr. King moved on his work, and by the way, Dr. King, I've already told you about Daddy King, but before Daddy King was James King. James King was his father. James King was a sharecropper. James King was an alcoholic. James King beat his wife. Did you want to hear this part of the story? Did you just hear it? Dr. King, Daddy King, James King. James King, the grandfather of Dr. King, beat his wife, was a functional alcoholic, was depressed, was a sharecropper. But he want to make God laugh, tell him your plan. And lost creates leaders. It rained on Solomon. Storms. Because Martin King Sr. left the house of his dad, refused to let him beat his mother not one more time, but said he was going to go out and make something of himself and would make sure he honored his children in a different way. But my point here is that these are imperfect people. It's you and me. Let me put a bit more context on this. On the other side of James King is a guy that gets no credit whatsoever. The second pastor, but really the founding pastor of Ebenezer, Ebenezer was A.D. Williams. A.D. Williams was the guy who built Ebenezer, the original civil rights leader. And A.D. Williams had a beautiful daughter named Alberta. Daddy King was smart enough to marry into this family. <laughs> he married Alberta, took over Ebenezer the church as if it was his own legacy. Now, A.D. Williams was a businessman. He owned all the real estate on what was in Sweet Auburn, Auburn Avenue, the Black Wall Street. By the way, I was told 20 years ago, 30 years ago, this was an incredibly booming community filled with pride and kids passionate about going to school. I'll come back to that in a minute. When Coretta Scott King, ladies don't get the credit they deserve now, when Coretta Scott King, after Dr. King was assassinated, decided to sustain his legacy, by the way, never got married again. Hello. And if it wasn't for Coretta Scott King, there would be no King legacy. He'd be some old guy who did good things in the Civil Rights Movement. It was, the, it was Coretta Scott King who pushed to make this day a holiday. Yeah. And she deserves her justice. But my point here, thank you. My point here is that when she went to go build the King Center, listen now, she didn't, everybody said the King Center now in Atlanta, they said, oh, that's a, it's a federal protected property. It's a park service there. That's not the way this story began. The way it began was a little humble building owned by A.D. Williams. I love this. Real estate owned by Daddy King. They didn't have to beg anybody to go build their King Center for their favorite son. The Bible suggests in Proverbs to be poor is not to not have anything, to be poor is not to not do anything, and lazy hands make a man poor. Are you following me? I know I'm boring you, so I guess I gotta bring this. Oh, I, I got a little self-esteem. I didn't know you were with me out here. My point is that Dr. King is that tree trunk. But his mother, his father, his grandmother, his grandfather, even the great grandfather that wasn't no good in some ways informed and instructed, inspired and uplifted his life to make him who he could be. No different than that young man there is instructed by his mother and his father. No different than Smith is instructed by his mother and his father. Ambassador Andrew Young, last story I'll tell you before I cut to the chase. Ambassador Andrew Young has a very interesting story in the roadway. People tease him because he wasn't arrested enough <laughs> in the civil rights movement. He finally went to Florida and got his rear end whipped, and he brags about that all the time. But 
Dr. King never wanted him arrested. Why? He was a strategist. He was a thinker. And before Ambassador Young came to work for Dr. King, he worked for the United Methodist Church. He came down trying to volunteer. Remember now, no good deeds shall go unpunished. And Abernathy and other workers of Dr. King, Dr. King was out doing his thing, saying, no, we don't need you. Translation, we got this thing locked up. Everybody got a roll, everybody got a lane. You think there was jealousy in the civil rights movement? If you don't think there was pettiness in the civil rights movement, if you don't think there was small mindedness and winning battles and losing wars and play hate, so they sent Andrew Young packing, but he didn't give up. He came back with a budget. United Methodist Church gave him enough money to fund his salary. Now, this may not sound like a big deal. But I'm connecting civil rights with silver rights. Did you catch that? I'm connecting civil rights with silver rights. I'm about to bring it right home, right to your doorstep, right to your movement, right here in Denver. Because Andrew Young came back to Atlanta with his own budget, nobody can say a thing to him. You couldn't fire him. Which made him Dr. King's most prized asset. Because now he can say anything, anywhere, to anyone without retribution. Did you get that? And that's what allowed Ambassador Young to be this orator. But he was also a little kid growing up. And who was Andrew Young? Andrew Young's father was a dentist. And Andrew Young's grandfather was a dentist who also owned an insurance company. Another middle class family. And when Andrew Young became you an ambassador. President Carter said to his father, you must be so proud of this young man. He's the UN ambassador for the United States of America. And his father said, no, I'm not really. He'd be something if he was a dentist. <laughs> <laughs> and then when Dr. King, when Andrew Young got the Nobel, I mean the uh, UN appointment, he went to a southern town where his beautiful wife, Jean Charles Young, grew up and they were in a parade in the southern town, and Jean Chow Young reached over and tapped Andy Master Young and said, she called him Andy, Andy, see that man over there in the corner, the drunk, the bum, I grew up with him, I went to school with him. And he said, and Master Young said, well, you're lucky you didn't go marry him. <laughs> and, then, and then Jean Chow Young, without missing a beat, said, no, if I married him, he'd be you in the past of the <laughs> together. You start to see the relevance of all this 
in just a minute. Can I have a couple more minutes? Okay. I'm just trying to set this up <laughs> properly because what you're doing here is important. You're sitting in a moment in history and you don't even know it. So when you think about those tapes, go back there and watch the tapes. Look at the photographs of the marches and look at who integrated what. What got integrated? Was it first public buildings? No. Was it universities? No. Was it city hall? Absolutely not. <laughs> were pushing back with police and local militia. Yes, it was the private sector. It was Woolworths, the store. It was, think about it now, don't take my word for it, visualize, it was department stores that allowed them to sit at the county. They took down those white only signs. Because after a few weeks of sitting like this with Ambassador in New York, and then sitting like this as a cash register wasn't ready, and then sitting up like this. After a while, they were sitting like this. It sounds real interesting. Their morals didn't change, their economics did. And after a while, they said, I don't care when you come through the front door, the back door, through the window, on the roof, just hit that cash register. I need my customers back. Civil rights and silver rights have always been part. So I told you a little bit about the Dr. King you don't know. I told you a little bit about the Ambassador Andrew Young that you don't know. By the way, when Dr. King was killed in Memphis, he was focused not on racism and not on war. He was focused on power. And he went to Memphis because sanitation workers did not have adequate compensation. Because they didn't even have a place to go to the restroom. They had no break room. They had no rights whatsoever. And he knew that this was a just cause because the mainstream workers were getting a pay more than the black workers to do the same exact job. So he went to Memphis for the Poor People's Campaign. And when he was assassinated, by the way, I didn't assassinate it over money. You want, you want to get out of here quickly? Start talking about redistributing the wealth of the top 3%. <laughs> Being a Nobel Peace Prize winner with a record of mobilizing millions of people. And by the way, this movement was not black. Very important. It was about poor whites. and more poor whites in America than poor anybody else. It was about poor Latinos and African Americans and Asians and Indians and moving everybody up. <laughs> 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 <It's not ready. laughs> Dr. King said this in 68. You cannot legislate goodness. And you cannot pass the law to force someone to respect you. The only way to social justice in a capitalist country is economic parity. Right. Mm -hmm. Ownership. That was 1968, and they killed it. Yeah. And I've argued we've had a wilderness period for 40 years. That's right. We've been lost. That's right. Without a plan, without a map, and Dr. King never got far enough to lay it out. That's right. But when he was on that balcony, and when Andrew Young, the master Andrew Young, that was appointed, remember the that's where the rifle shot came from. Later on, Ambassador told me, the FBI informed him. The instructions for the shooter, if you miss Dr. King, get Andrew Young. If you can't get the dream, get the thing. Dr. King's friend, Ambassador Andrew Young, has survivor's guilt today. He's 79 and he will not stop. He cannot sleep because he believes he was mayor, UN ambassador, congressman, president of the Medal of Freedom Award, 100 honorary doctor degrees, and he's done so well because his friend was slain. But rainbows only follow the storm. You cannot have a rainbow without a storm for it first. Let me get real personal. In my book, Love Leadership, I say there's two things in the world. There's love and there's fear. And what you don't love you fear. And the reason this world is all screwed up is that some of our so-called leaders have been leading by fear. And fear has relatives. Short-termism. What do I get? Not what do I have to get? Right. Right. I want to get rich, not I want to build wealth. What do I get and when do I get it and what are you going to do for me? It's about me, me and not about we. That's it. Yeah. That's it. In this global economic crisis that we are dealing with 
down. I don't call it a recession, I call it a reset. Mm. It's not an economic crisis, it's a crisis of virtues and values. In this crisis we're dealing with right now, we treat it individuals like transactions and not like relationships. Yeah. If, you had, if we had treated everybody like a relationship, you would not have a crisis. If we make every mortgage loan like you see your grandmother, you would not have a crisis. Am I going too far going too deep? No, take it, take it, take it. They wanted to kill Andrew Young because he had the master plan. He had a strategy for teaching people the language of money. And what I would argue is, while we're sitting here talking about I have a dream, my pastor, Reverend Murray, would say, the best way to start living your dream is to start by waking up. All right. <laughs> that my girl, Dr. Dorothy Heights, has just gone to heaven, been promoted. I don't know if you know Dr. Dorothy Heights' legacy. I hope you write down these names and do some research later. Dr. Dorothy Heights was the lady. The reason why Dr. King gave the speech on the mall in Washington. I, I, I love this. Amazing. Everybody thinks that Dr. King, that was his day. Right. Nothing could be further from the truth. Yeah. That was A. Philip Randolph's march. Yes, it was. Yes, the it was. They haven't had it for 20 years. By the way, my other mentor, Quincy Jones, says it takes 20 years to change the culture. Mm -hmm. I'd argue in the last 20 years, we made dumb sexy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> we dumbed down and celebrated. Come on. And we've got to make smart sexy again. Yes, and that's why I like to hear, I met two dentists here who are going to do some mentoring. I believe you're one of them. I'll get to you and just a minute. I'm not going to motivate you. You don't need to be motivated. I'm not your psychologist. I'm not here to give you therapy. I'm here to hopefully lay out a framework, a strategy, a plan for what comes Next. Because we're not a statistic. We've been doing so much with so little for so long, we can almost do anything with nothing. But there's a difference between being broke and being poor. To be broke is economic, but to be poor is a disabling frame of mind and the present condition of your spirit, and you must vow never, ever, ever to be poor. Dr. Dorothy Heights, see, women are 
psychological genius. You don't have the big boat like like Mr. Smith's father. You, you got to use your brain. You, know, you, you, you let the guy do the thing and then, and then convince the guy that it was his idea. <laughs> in eight minutes. Yeah. Nobody remembers anything else. There were two and a half hours of speeches. Nobody remembers anything else. And Dr. King had given that speech a hundred times before the March on Washington. In rooms like this where folks were going to sleep. In schools like this where kids were like, huh? And I'm sure that by, I'm sure the superintendents that, 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 that Dr. King said, why am I doing this? Nobody cares. I'm sure you feel like this every Tuesday. Nobody cares. <laughs> you know, it reminds me, the superintendent reminds me of a guy who told his mother, I'm not going to school today. I'm depressed. I'm tired. I'm sick and tired. I, I don't want to deal with this. I got a headache. You got to go. So I ain't got to do nothing. I don't want to go. Then you got to go. Why do I have to go? Because you're the superintendent. Anyway. <laughs>
So I went and met with President Bush, and President Bush had his old cabinet there, and, and he came to me, he had his nickname, he said, oh, well, Johnny Boy, tell us over here to, to do today. How, how you doing, Johnny Boy? So I'm doing this, I'm doing well, Mr. President, as long as you never forget the Johnny part. And <laughs> In states in America, if you haven't noticed, are cutting employees, expenses, and services because increasingly the outflow exceeds the inflow, and when your overhead exceeds your uh, inflow, your, your overhead will be your downfall. They are broke. The agenda is economics. In this global economic crisis, people in here, everybody in here knows somebody who bought too much house. We were paymentized. We bought a car like you buy a toaster at Sears. We bought a house like you get a toaster at Sears. What's the payment? And you never buy a home with a payment with an interest rate attached. You have brilliant, highly educated people who don't have a clue how money works. Number one cause of divorce, money. Number one reason that black and brown kids are out of college, not academics, money. Number one reason for domestic abuse, money. Here's my prediction. The new civil rights issue, post-economic crisis, is financial literacy. Because if you don't understand the language of money, and you don't have a bank account, you're an economic slave. And here comes the payday lender, and the rent to own store, and the check cash, and the liquor store, and the rent, I don't know if you heard it, the renting rim store. <laughs> you know the 20 inch rim for spinners? Nobody 
wakes up in the morning other than an academic and says, ooh, I can't wait to go get an education. Yeah. They want to be successful. Yeah. We need to realign aspiration and education. And when you do that, the endorphins start firing that kid's head about what they can do and who they can be. Here's what the, the survey did. 50 million kids, third grade, fourth grade through 12th grade in America. Here's what it showed, 3% margin of error. 91% of all kids are not afraid to take risks. 77% 77 of all kids want to be their own boss. That's impressive. But only 5% of kids have a business intern or a business program. Now, let, just, just let that sit with you for a minute. You want to talk about a death sentence of hope? If I have an aspiration to be my own boss, to do my own thing, to be successful, I go from hopeful and enthusiastic with no intervention in my life to skeptical, then cynical, then irrelevant, then dropping out of school, then life, and then I'm going to drop into something else that I'm not stupid, I just don't have good role models. We have got to move that 5% role model number right here in Denver. you got to see, it's not about the statistics, it's about the trend. The superintendent tells me the trend line is up for these schools. That should give you reason for hope. But if you can get role models to come into these schools, you get business leaders to come into these schools. Then it's a financial literacy course. And then in the auditorium, do a mini pitch of it. And say you got two minutes to pitch your business idea. And with $300, I'll fund your business. With $100, I'll fund your business. With $500 for high school students, I'll fund your business. And the endorphins are firing that kid's head about who they can be and what they can do. And now they're off and running. And that kid may be broke again, but that kid will never be poor. could say in three years that these schools move from 5%, from 77, 5, 77, 5, they want to be their own boss, 5% role models, to 77, 25. 77 who want to be their own boss and 25% who have a business internship or a business role model. You fundamentally change them. Did you hear me? You fundamentally, because now the ecosystem, the whole culture is about entrepreneurship and self-help and empowerment. And a hand up, not a hand up. Ladies and gentlemen, the, and I, I'm done. I've been told I've talked too long, and I apologize. But my message to you is that this story about America's prominence being over is wrong. 52% of Americans today say that China is the economic leader in the world. Today, 52% of all Americans say China is the economic leader. Here's the step America's GDP is $15 trillion. China's, if you believe their numbers, is six trillion. That means that China, put it in the bucket. Germany, France, throw in Brazil, throw in Russia, and still have room. We have a confidence problem, folks. We have a crisis of confidence. We don't believe in ourselves. There's nothing we can do. There's nobody in here who can't change the world right here in the world city. So, I'm done. As we go home, as we go home and you bring this on this King Day celebration, think about young Derek. I'm thinking about this young man, I'm thinking about Derek. Derek was, can I have a chair? Derek was in this urban school and where everything's dumbed down and what up, yo, 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 what's up, try to be cool. So Derek came in and was sitting like this. Now, Smith came in with a suit on. And after the first session, Derek put his hand up meekly. By the second week, Derek was a little bit more confident. The third week, he's punching a hole in the ceiling in the eye, this is the sky. The fourth week, he wears his only suit. <laughs> he graduates in the fifth week. He's walking down the hallway. Kids say, why are you hanging out with people? That ain't about nothing. You need to come hang out with us. So I go, I know you see this all the time. I go to try to defend Derek's honor. Put my hand around and say, Derek, you and these two kids, your two friends, I want to give you $70 each. Make a decision about Nike. You got five minutes. Kids are great. We don't need five minutes. The other two kids say, I want to buy some Air Jordans. Which you need another $30. <laughs> Derek says, I want to buy one share of Nike stock. 
Now, is this the beginning of the story or the end? It's the beginning. All his so-called friends jump on there. Man, why you want that stock? That 